I'm John Cruz, professional bass angler, and you are watching Bass Life Podcast. All right, here we are back with another episode of Bass Life Podcast with myself, the host, John Cruz, and my good friend, Byron Childers, known Byron a long time. But if you're not familiar with the Bass Life Podcast, uh, this is the third episode. We've done some other episodes, and what we're going to be doing is going to get people in here that live, eat, breathe bass, bass fishing, and all about bass. But if bass is your life, this is the place that you want to be, and that's why we got this dude in here, because he is the director of sales for Missile Baits. But not only that, you have been into fishing for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and he's been in the fishing industry for a long, long time. So not only does he like to fish, but you work and talk about fishing and fishing lures all the time. So that, I mean, what more of a perfect guest to have on. So I want to say thanks for stopping in. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. Good, good. So I want first, I'm just going to go right and get right into it. Let's do it. How did you get into bass fishing? I had no choice. Um, I believe the year, my dad was a huge bass fisherman. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all I've ever known. And I had, I had him bring a prop in, which we'll get to in a second. Yes. But uh, so old, where, where, where was this uh, place that you, you grew up? So early on, early on, born in Memphis and uh, dad was really active there. He had lived in Kentucky, West Kentucky before that and got into bass fishing. But uh, at this time he was in the Memphis bass club for years, 20 years. It's on the jacket. He's and the Memphis, the... the Memphis bass club is, was the original, one of the original clubs in the deals at that time 70s 80s you know uh, bill dance was in there charlie spence the original owner of strike king was in there um all kinds of guys big time and that's what yeah. i asked you to bring yeah your dad's jacket so do, check this out dean childers Pre he was the president in 1987 yeah i would have been three and he's got all the so the St. Jude, Jude Bass Classic was a charity event for St. Jude's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's all the years he fished it. Seven, every year from 76 to 91. To 91. Wow, right there on the side. And then the top 20. The top 20. Those three years, I'm, I'm imagining it's a stout, it was a stout group. There was, from my understanding, there was hundreds of people in the Memphis Bass Memphis Club. Memphis Bass Club. You know, this is, and, and bass clubs were the like the only deal back in those days because uh -huh. they didn't have all these um, you know bfls and um, all these team tournament trails all collegiate the, stuff all the high school stuff. High school. yeah all that stuff that didn't exist it was like you fish tournaments you either fish the bassmaster or you fish club tournaments right that's mm -hmm. pretty much it yeah so that's why they had huge groups of people in these clubs and Memf the memphis bass club is famous from from back in the day so your dad was deeply involved obviously he was a president at one point, and that's what you grew up in that house. Just right? around it, yeah. Around it all the time. Yeah, he was fishing every weekend. And to me, to me, that's always been normal, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then when I got a little older, he had gotten into golf for a while. We moved to Florida because of business. He was in the glass industry. About uh, how old were you when you went to Florida? I think it was eighty nine. Okay. So five, six. Okay. Um, could have been ninety, but. I was getting into fishing then. Um, we would go get a John boat, my grandfather's John boat. We re redid that together. And whereabouts in Florida were you? So this you was go? this was Tampa. Okay. So they had a bunch of little lakes out behind the house, and mm -hmm. we'd go out there and fish. And then uh, in, I think we lived there for three or four years. Then we moved to South Florida. He transferred, got a different job, and uh, there, there's six seven nine pounders in the backyard in canals just the, in that canal system it's like the lower end of the everglades is what yeah but like for flood control and stuff because it's all flat mm -hmm. there's canals in every neighborhood side of the turnpike there's canals so we would fish there i'd walk the bank get home from school and be out till dark 
you know, fishing off the bank. Yeah. So the first big fish over five pounds I caught was seven something. I got it mounted, but it was in 1995. Mm -hmm. So that would have put me at 11 years old. Uh, caught my first seven pounder and uh, I was done. That's all you wanted to do? Yeah. So then I wanted to be a pro and, you know, got a little older and that was my dream to, you know, fish tournaments and started mm -hmm. fishing this junior tournament trail in Broward County, Bob Newland. Mm -hmm. um, still talk to Bob. He's awesome. It's funny um, the, the relationships you make in this industry just. Yeah. You keep them for years and yeah, years. like 14 years old, I meet Bob Newland, the Broward County Junior Bass Trail. And uh, so dad and I would do that. He would drive the boat, the same John boat, and uh, I'd fish. But won several of those and um, ended up another friend of ours, Bill Smith, came to talk to the kids. Mm -hmm. And I was 15 at this, this time. He came to talk to the kids. And I'm like, my God, this is a pro. You know, he was down fishing. What'd you guys fish? Bass, FLW, FLW. started, and mm -hmm. then the Everstart, Everstart. at that time. Yep. So, like, you guys were in Okeechobee for a month. Basically, yeah. Um, and Bill would come down for a month and just yep. get, getting, I don't want to get ahead of the connection, but Bill was the reason that we met Yeah. back in the day. Yeah. I actually was rooming with Bill. Uh, I don't even know how I... I don't even remember how it was I your first year. Yeah, I don't know how I connected with Bill though. Um, but know. Bill and I, I, I roomed as Crappy a co angler. Luck. No, yeah, I roomed as a co angler, and he was on the pro side. Yeah, and, and we stayed together. And, and then the next year, I jumped over to the pro side, and we roomed together again. We roomed together for at least two years. Yeah, on on the FLW tour side, and then I think it was when I was, I think it was still a co angler. It was that year that. We got introduced a little over 20 years ago. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So he came and talked to us, and then he uh, he's like, man, my grandfather had a boat just like that. you know. So we hit it off, you know, Kentucky. We were Tennessee. And right. He's like, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, nothing. He's like, well, if your dad will bring you up to Clewiston, you know, you can go fishing with me. So I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I didn't sleep. And that's, and, that, that's Bill, though. He, yeah. He'll just give you the shirt off his Some back. Some 15-year-old kid Whatever. you just met. Yeah. Hey, you, know, you want to go fishing? Let's go. And, uh, yeah, that's Bill. So anyway, we did that for years after, uh, he would come down and I'd pre-fish with him every weekend. I was available in January. And then if he had, uh, uh, Judy with him, mm -hmm. he was like, well, you know, here's, why don't you just go with John? You know? Well then Bill, I think he got out of it or was fishing something else. And then you and I would do that every year. Right. Yeah. And it, Bill, uh, I think he, he got, involved more with his dad's business because i think his for dad a time, yeah. for a time his dad retired yeah um from uh, it was a big dump truck bed yeah business ox bodies or something yeah something like that and and they were you know big business and bill worked for him growing up so he knew the business in and out and then i remember he's like i gotta stay home and get this mm -hmm. you know and then he's starting a family right get around the same town and yeah. all that around the same time so Family business. He had that. He kind of got out of it for a while, but he still definitely fishes. Oh yeah, a yeah. Lot. He just fished the uh, championship on Cumberland for the Toyota series. Mm -hmm. He's and he's a very good versatile. Yeah. Angler, but um, he he was kind of mentored me for. I mean, hell, ever since then. Yeah. Um, we still talk on a regular basis, but just it goes back to those relationships. That, yeah. That, and know, he had and, a tackle shop for a while. He started. Uh, he started with the tackle trailer, backwaters in yeah. tow. Yep. And uh, through a sponsor of his at the time, who was local to me, I would go in there and pick up baits for him and take him to the lake and ended up working there for... Gambler. 14, yeah, Gambler Lures Gambler. in Because that was right in your backyard. Right there, yeah. So what a, what a better place to get to know the people. Yep. And then, So got uh, to know the original owners, uh, Mike Sermon and Russ Bringer. Mm -hmm. And um, then Russ passed away, unfortunately. And then Mike sold the company. And at this point, I was 20, 20, 21 years old and uh, stopped by just trying to get some jigs and hit Val up for a, a job. Told me no two or three times. And and this is what, how old were you, 20? I was 20. Yeah. 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 We, uh, we celebrated my 21st birthday at ICAST in Vegas, um, which was not pretty. Right. Considering I was there working the booth. And I'm supposed to be there at 8 a.m. And from what I remember, it was uh, 
who was the one that really put you under that night? I think somebody took you under their wing and made it made you completely miserable. Can oh, buy any drinks? No, it was Val. Everybody. And Val. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. No, he's like, it we're was going Val. out, you know, Vegas, the Strip, you know, first time you're, he's 21 years old. And yeah, so uh, we Val, go out, trying we to be a nice down. guy. Trying, trying to be, be a nice, nice guy. guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice guy. And uh, his <laughs> parents were there. Uh, like the whole company goes out. And, uh, you know, Debbie, our office manager, her husband, like the whole crew's out there. And they're all buying me drinks. I mean, and I'm just wasted. You know, we're sitting at the... Yeah, thanks the, a lot, Val. We're sitting at the poker table, and I'm, like, mouthing, and the pit boss had to come tell me to, you know, be quiet. And then was, I knocked a beer over on the blackjack table, and, I mean, it was it was horrible. It was bad. And then uh, he's like, all right, man, well, you know, you're up first shift tomorrow. You need to be at the booth at 8 a.m. And I'm like, yeah, you know. So uh, I woke up around noon with Val and another buddy of ours, Don DeMont, standing at the foot of the bed. And I'm like, oh my God, I've screwed this up bad, you know. And he didn't fire you. He didn't fire and me. You stayed there for another... Another 13... 13 years. 14 years, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so it wasn't... You know, it's that first impression you made. Yeah. <laughs> I felt horrible, though. Like, felt horrible. Thought I just screwed up my dream job, and it uh, it was bad, but... He and I are out a couple of weeks after that fishing in the Everglades together, and he was like, "Man, I," uh, he's like, "I gotta, I gotta confess something." I'm like, "What's that?" He's like, "I do that to all my new sales reps," and I'm like, "You what?" He's like, "Oh yeah, no, I did that on purpose." He's like, "Cause you'll never do that again." Yep. Out on the road, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "You son of a," you know. But I don't think he ever clued his parents into the joke. Because I, I felt like they weren't right. a big fan of they mine were, ever since. <laughs> <laughs> For the rest of the 13 For like, years. Yeah, like, I don't it know. Was Val, they probably were... still don't like me. Right. So. Yeah. So it, that's uh, that's awesome. But I learned. And so now John doesn't have to worry about any of that. Exactly. And uh, Val didn't either. So it, uh, it worked you gotta out got to pay your dues. Yeah. So. so you first, you fished your first, you know, so going back a little bit, you go, you fished your first tournament. When you were what in the in your teens with those junior tournaments? Probably thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, they had wow. five. It was they would have them at all the county parks in Broward County. So there was four or five um, that they'd rotate through. And uh, yeah, so started fishing tournaments at thirteen or fourteen, and that got me into wanting to fish. And then y'all were and so you were fishing Okeechobee and the Everglades. Where else did you fish down there? So we would go. I mean, the Everglades are basically from Okeechobee south. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, just Holiday Park, uh, Sawgrass, Loxahatchee was 15 minutes from the house. So I would go out there after work. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I got the job with Gambler, I had a wholesale seafood company job mm-hmm. with a buddy of ours. And uh, Bumblebee Tuna, how are you? Oh, doing? gosh, it was the stinkiest thing <laughs> you've ever seen. I would strip in the garage. Because you like it's worse than working in the power bait factory, huh? Yes, like it's just dead fish, and like you would days later, you'd sit in church and smell your hands. Oh my god! Like you're gosh. sitting in church, you're like, what? What does that smell? You know, you're like, oh, Ooh, it's it's me. my hands from, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so I, you know, once again, great opportunity. It was an experience, yeah. but I was ready to do something I liked right. more. Yeah. So. But uh, I would take the boat to work. Dad had sold his golf clubs by this time to buy me a tracker. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would take the tracker to work with me and knock off and go fish the Everglades till dark at that point. So I upgraded from the canals to the to the tracker in the yeah. Everglades and we'd go to Okeechobee on the weekends. But. And then so you, and then there you started fishing BFLs and things like that. So you had to be, the way I remember it, you had to be 16 yep. in order to fish them. Um, so I was 16 in May, so dad was already fishing them as a Mm co-angler. And then come May, I was able to jump in the last two of the year. So I fished the last red man they ever had. Mm -hmm. Before they switched over to the BFL. Before they switched over to the BFL. Yeah. So that was cool. Yeah. When I started fishing them, it was red man's. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, but yeah, did, uh, did the non-boater thing in the BFLs for a couple years and then moved to the front. And um, I fished them every year, along with every local tournament. Derby. 
We joined we made the a basketball. Few, made a few regionals. Made a couple day. regionals. From, from won, the won the points, the points in one 07. year. Yeah, yep. as a boater. So that was and then cool. And then at what? So now you, know, now you live in Nashville area. Mm-hmm. At what point did you move to Tennessee? How how long ago was that? So I was traveling um, up here or up to Tennessee for work and uh, calling on dealers or running the tournaments or whatever and just really fell in love with middle tennessee um and i'm like man i'm gonna live here just it would pain Mm -hmm. me to go home uh we had we have some friends that i would come stay with i'd stay an extra day and hang out with them around franklin and Mm -hmm. it's just beautiful Um, but something was always telling me like you know this is where you need to be so uh my father passed away in 2011 and uh mom was just done you know she's like i'm moving back home to missouri and you can stay here or go with me and i'm like well that's that's a lot more closer to nashville so i'm like i'll go with you right and uh, as soon as we got to missouri i was coming over here looking for an apartment right met my wife in that time we started dating then that sped up the process uh significantly Mm mm-hmm and uh, so 2013, uh, May of 2013, I was living in Franklin, Tennessee. And, it, and at this point, you'd been working for Gambler for a number of years, mm-hmm. and you'd really kind of become burnt out on the fishing side of it, the tournament side of it, and you were doing other things you know, yeah doing a lot so of gun, i, I doing felt a lot like i kind of hit like that right hit the uh hit the ceiling there i mean it's it's uh from a work perspective from a mean, work perspective a lot of people get you know you're in a job for a certain number of years if it's not becoming new or if it's not uh you're not progressing you you start having other interests yes other than, and it's just natural you know yeah so and then you know like well i'm doing this every day and you know, fishing and uh, dad wasn't there. So it was kind of weird still for a while. And yeah. then, you know, cause we did that together. Hell, he got me into it. That's all I ever knew. Um, so when I moved, I found, you know, YouTube with gun stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I really, I found a couple guys that I subscribed to on there and was like, man, you know, he's, this guy's local and he's teaching a bunch of classes and he's so, got a school. And so you like, did a bunch of tactical classes. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to be friends with that guy, you know? And mm-hmm. so I went out there and met him and I took nine classes, um, over the course of three, four years mm-hmm. and, uh, just trying to be harder to kill. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just is good to it's good stuff have all to that know. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but take out what you and need, it, you, and you took all that fishing energy and and put it towards that for a span of time. Yes, and uh, I, you know, during this whole time period, you and I've been friends ever since for twenty some years. Yep, and I mean, you knew that in twenty twelve started missile baits, and yep. we were progressing and growing. We'd see each other at all the shows. Yep. And we'd always go out to then dinner. Then we'd hang out. Like, yeah, we'd go out to it dinner. It was me hanging out with the Missile Crew. That's right. From That's 2012 right. on. Yeah. Right, right, basically. Yeah. So then uh, we and just... And I always thought, I'm like, man, it'd be really cool to work there one day. <laughs> yeah. So then then one one year, um, we go to the Big Rock show uh-huh. in in January. I think this was 18. 2018. 18. And we go to the show, and I had already talked to Julie, our office manager... She's Julie loves Byron. If you, by the way, she loves Byron. I love Julie. Um, but so she had already asked me about you, and I said, I said, yeah, I think this might be the year. I was like, I think we're getting to the point where we need a dedicated salesperson to handle all the leads and to do everything from that side. I was like, yeah, I, like Byron's at the top of the list. You know, I got a, a couple other people that you know, because I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. and want to make sure. So, but yeah, he's definitely on top of the list. So I go somewhere during the, the show at, at Big Rock and I come back and Julie's got this face like, uh-oh. And I looked at Julie and, I, and Byron's standing there, which is normal <laughs> at the shows. So I look at Julie and she's got this funny and I said, what's wrong? And then she, and I look at Byron and Byron's smiling and she goes, I accidentally told him. I said, wait, told him what? 
oh, you told him we want to hire him. And she's like, sorry, I'm sorry. But so anyway. <laughs> so Julie and I would eat lunch at the show together every day for years. <laughs> so she would come by my booth and most of the time I was there by myself or somebody mm -hmm. was there, they'd watch it. But, you know, we, that was our thing. We would go to lunch at the show every Every yep. time together, so we're and sitting if there Ashley, eating lunch. If your, and, if your wife Ashley was there, then she yeah, we'd she'd join us. Yeah. yeah, Ashley. And so it was, uh, but it was really funny because it it was just not the way I was picturing it to come out. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It was going to come out sooner or later, yeah. so it didn't matter. And uh, so Byron ended up officially coming to work at Missile in uh, in May of May. 2018. He'd been been here ever since, doing knockout job, just killing it. Uh, for us, and it's been a huge help for me to take all that, all the sales, day-to-day um, -day stuff off my, off my plate. So that's mm -hmm. been that's been huge. But to get back to you, and the fishing side of it, we've had a lot of conversations about this. But when when we hired you, we talked about why don't you want to fish some more, and I thought it was important that you you do fish. Mm -hmm. So next thing you know, now you're having a skeeter boat in your driveway, and you're going every year fishing, a couple weekends a, a month, yeah, most all year. Uh, you've made a number of newer friends in the last couple of years uh -huh. um, in the Middle Tennessee area. Then you kind of rotate between the different people, so you have you know, fresh faces to go fish with. You're fishing. All the different, what all bodies of water are you fishing there in Tennessee now? Um, so since you forced me to fish again, um, I, and I was, I was, he's like, well, it's kind of required that you fish. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. But to me, in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is new. It's fresh. And it's not Okeechobee. It's, it's not, not the Okeechobee. Everglades. And so something clicked like, okay, that, that previous chapter is done. Mm -hmm. And this is a brand new one. And like I was re-energized, um, it seemed like overnight, like instantly. It, well, it did. It and more like it. fired up than I'd ever been. And now I'm like, I'm in Tennessee. I know nothing. I sold all my rods while I was living in an apartment, you know, so I had, you know, I needed to get new rods. And I mean, I started back from scratch. Right. So I'm, I'm researching everything. Like, you know, how do you throw a drop shot? Mm -hmm. What's a Ned rig? You know, but all these things that we're coming out with and making, I'm like, I need to fish all of these and be able to, to use Talk them well. Talk intelligently about them. Yeah. You know, like, what's your favorite whatever? You know, well, I, I've thrown it all, like, you know. Um, and then to go beyond that, like, we want to be the experts in our field, so I feel like I need to know all of the new stuff. Whether we make right. it or not, I want to know it. And I want right. to be able right. to do it. Um, There's a lot of other companies that come out with innovative, cool stuff, and we're like, should have thought of that that's gonna that's catch really fish. cool i'm gonna need that that's really cool if yeah a customer ask about that i'm like yep i've seen yep. it in the water that's the real deal and i have no problem suggesting those baits to or theirs, you know the opposite if you see something like i've seen that in the water it looks like hot garbage yeah I that's would a never turd. Buy it. so <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah to, to to get back um it's been fun learning uh just the lakes around Tennessee, mm -hmm. um, because Percy it's Priest. not Florida. So Percy Priest is, is Old Hickory. basically my home lake. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 35, 40 minutes from Priest. Old Hickory, uh, which are two totally different lakes. Um, you've got the Cumberland River right there. Yep. You've got Woods Reservoir. There's Tim's a bunch Ford. of little ones. Yeah. yeah, a bunch of smaller reservoirs all over Tennessee. Dale Hollow yep. is a couple hours, which that was a lot of fun. You've you know, been down this to Pickwick. Spring, been to Pickwick this summer. Um, that was cool. Uh, Kentucky Lake's not far, and it's it's coming back. So I haven't yeah. ventured out there just yet, but it's it's coming back. And one of the other, we, we, we Gunnersville. I failed to mention it, but you, when you said Kentucky Lake, it, it reminded me. One of the other people that you met early on mm -hmm. when you were a teenager age. Before was, that. Yeah, before you, you know, when you were very young. Is Mark Menendez. Yeah. And he's still somebody you talk with quite often. Yep. Yep. Mark, he sold my last boat for me. So. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so he's a I mean, really good guy. He's, he, he's, he's good. We're good. So Byron may owe him dinner. I don't know. Yes. I'm just saying. Yeah. And he's getting married. Is he marrying yeah, her? To a woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yep. Um, whatever, whatever floats his boat, seriously. Um, but I just, he, I can't get past the khakis still. He has, uh, Mark's a good guy. If you're not really familiar with Mark Winnett, he's been fishing forever. Yeah. You and he are the elder statesman, correct? Absolutely. He's been fishing a long time. Um, he's had some really awful luck in as far as uh, his, his health, injury this his year. wife's health. Um, Meningitis. His, his, he had his, his wife, his previous wife, Donna, passed away of cancer. And now he's dating a new lady. And we just learned mm -hmm. they're going to be getting married. So yep. that is great news. For Mark, he's um, happy again. I mean, he's happy. Guy. He's doing right. great, and the uh, and just a wealth of fishing knowledge. That's somebody else yeah. I'd like to get on this seat. I should. Have oh yeah, if I can. But anyway, um, so just the connections and what a small world fishing. Yeah. So when really Dad is. was fishing in Kentucky in the bass clubs, he lived in Mayfield and then Paducah. Uh, Mark's dad, Jesus, owned a glass shop, which Dad sold to Jesus, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the way it was told to me, Jesus, you know, he's Cuban nationality and mm -hmm. didn't have any interest in bass fishing on Kentucky Lake. Uh, but Mark did. And so uh, they talked or whatever. And he's like, man, I'll, yeah, I'll take him. So um, to my knowledge, you know, Mark joined the bass club that dad was in. And dad would, you know, Mark couldn't drive yet. So he'd pick him up and tow his tracker to the lake or whatever. But they were... Wow. Uh, so your dad, your dad really was the instrumental one in getting Mark into getting him in the bass, bass club, fishing. and you know one of them, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't. This is like third, fourth hand information, but you know, right? Sounds good. Yeah, no, it's it's just it just goes back to what a smaller world. Yeah, but to me, it's like man, it's like meant to be. You know what right. I mean? Like stuff like that happens for a reason. Right, and you've so. been friends with him ever since. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, love the dude. Yeah, he's a great guy. So great guy. So. With having your, you learn you learned how to bass fish in Florida, mm -hmm. and I learned that a couple of years ago, uh, was it wasn't like a year before last, we went down to Florida to Benville Plantation mm -hmm. to do some filming, and Byron picked up that flipping stick and shot it through those hyacinths, uh, like he had he had been doing it the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before. That's so that, generous. It took me about a day to. Well, I mean, we had the other people on the trip were, or uh, Shannon, who's from Virginia, never, never punched in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, my stepson, Noah, who'd never punched in his life. Miles, who's over there behind the camera. Miles had never punched in his life. Uh, and then there was you and the, and the guide. Mm -hmm. So the two of y'all. I knew from BFLs down there. Right. Which, <laughs> small. And so the two, the two of you guys look like you were seasoned veterans. And obviously Mike Davis is a seasoned veteran. Yeah. Of punching. Uh, but he, uh, but you guys were, it was like old hat for you. So I just, I yeah. found that interesting. And that was cool to land here and then go there, go back down there and do that. And yeah, it, but, um, but to so, pick that up again. So. Yeah. So you, that's, that's who, how you started fishing. Mm -hmm. And now you've learned all these new techniques in, in middle Tennessee. You like throwing big baits. You like trying to catch big bass. Yep. Uh, it's kind of a cool deal. I think it's a cool deal. Uh, but you also like throwing the micro jig, especially yeah. micro football jig. You've kind of become a connoisseur of that. So I'll just ask you, what what technique do you feel like you are the most seasoned in? Or like, what's your like strongest bass fishing technique? What do you think? Currently, um, I do like the micro football jig. Uh, we mean, we just came out with that last year, mm -hmm. at the end of last year. And, um, I, I really enjoy the offshore stuff. Um, I did some of that in Florida in 07 when the lake was low mm -hmm. and that kind of got me out of that, you know, have to fish the grass shallow mentality. So up here, um, I really kind of gravitate towards the offshore stuff a lot. Do you, do you enjoy the visualization of what's under the water that you need to do? Is that part of the mystique like why do you why, what draws you to fishing like that i mean mainly the challenge um because i i didn't do any of that before so ledges are all new to me you and know? you feel like brush piles and that stuff do you feel like that's it, sometimes you're fishing for fish other people aren't fishing for 
Oh no, the ledges up by me are very busy. Mm. Um, but right. to me, so I, it's an I'm, art form. Yeah. So me, I'm I'm still learning all of this. Um, I like throwing a drop shot on the ledges. Uh, the Tokyo rig with a D bomb was was my deal this season. Mm -hmm. Whether it be uh, Gunnersville, I caught some fish on it at Pickwick, Old Hickory. So you don't think? So it's not like a it's not like a Carolina rig or, or punching or, or flipping a jig. Like, cause you're you more like your favorite or strongest is just fishing offshore in general, and just kind of figuring out what the yeah. I mean, strongest wouldn't be. So I'm learning all of it yeah. now. You know yeah, you're I mean? still so, in the gathering stage. We, there's a ton of anglers. The reason I'm asking is there's a ton of anglers out there that are hopefully listening right now that are saying, yeah, him, what he said, that's me. Yeah. So what do you, what's, like, what's your next step? Like, where do you want to develop as be like the expert in? So right now, I'm, and I'm trying to take it seasonally. And I'll tell you the, to get me up to speed, um... I mean, your videos are great, the ones mm. you've been doing here recently, yep. and it's they're super informative, but I think everybody can agree uh, nowadays, tactical bassin is just amazing. Yeah, so you're doing, you're still doing a lot of research. Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when I, when I got back into it, say three years ago, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, where do I start? You know, so I found tactical bassin on YouTube yep. and, you know, I'm like, whoa, and they go through the baits. Yeah. And the they're rods un, and, and the techniques and they're, they're unbiased. Just, I mean, and they're both good anglers. But I'm like, wow, it's winter and they take it seasonally. So, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'll do the same. So recently I bought some jigging spoons because mm -hmm. I've never, I've never caught a fish over 20 feet of water mm -hmm. ever in my life um, to this day. So you're So I want to get that. better at that. You mm -hmm. know, jigging spoons, blade baits, um, you know, I, I'm filling that out. Flutter spoons, you know, I was yep. working on last winter and yep. caught an eight pounder on a flutter spoon the other day, you mm -hmm. know, but in the winter versus the summer, how to fish it different. So just, I feel like I'm still getting back up, caught up to speed. On on everything. On everything non-Florida. Like yeah, so, can... so that's a good way to do it. So what you're saying is you, you try to just capture it seasonally. You're like, all right, yeah. what do I need to focus on in the winter? in the spring, in the summer. So you're not trying to learn 20 techniques. You're trying to learn three or four, maybe five yep. in one season. Then the next season you progress to... Because I didn't grow up in middle Tennessee. Right. And so what all of these other dudes that fish out there take for granted, because they've got, you know, all their years of experience out there. I've mm -hmm. got three, mm -hmm. you know, and you know as well as I do, Florida is just a different world. Yeah. So totally is. It, it, uh, but that's what's been fun and challenging and exciting for me is I'm learning all this new information and, and you know, watching your videos or, you know, any video on there and, you know, what I'm into and you're a trusted applying source. that, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever your trusted source is, but to go out and apply that. And it and, also, it also helps. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and bust you out on this. It also helps too that he talks to 20 to 50 dealers a day somewhere in that range at least yeah um you know so these dealers are all over the country yeah and you know tackle dealers are a great great source of information because all they do is listen to anglers that go out there and fish and then come back to them when they catch fish and need to buy more lures and then they tell them yep i caught them on this and this is the deal and then when they get five or six anglers that come in and say the exact same thing. They know that bite and that bait or, or mm -hmm. what's going on. So either the peg's yeah. empty or they call me to refill it. So, so then there's Byron on the phone talking to him yeah. and saying, hey, what's hot? Oh, yeah, well, actually, we just we just roasted, uh, we just sold out of uh, such and such a baits yeah. because uh, that bite is apparently on. And yeah, they, it's funny because the guys say that they're just slow rolling it on the bottom. I never would have fished it like that. Mm -hmm. Then you pick up all kind of information because he's, He's, you bass life. The bass is your life. Oh, yeah. And, and it's their life, too, if you're a tackle shop owner. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, a, that's a, um, a little quiet nugget of information that you yeah. get to uh, uh, put, keep to yourself, so to speak. So I think that's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. All right. So I know that since you've been in, in Tennessee and been fishing the last three years, uh -huh. and then you fished in Florida for a number of years, where, where, where did you catch your biggest bass? Here in Tennessee or was it in Florida? 
Tennessee. You've caught your biggest bass since you've been in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. and, and my biggest bag. And your biggest five. And the majority um, of the eight plus pounders. In three years time, I've caught more than I ever did in Florida in Tennessee. That's pretty amazing to be able to catch all those those big ones. Since you, and, and do you think that it's not because you're fishing better bodies of water? You're fishing. Um, you think you, it's your renewed focus or your your expanded horizon of like I I, I you kind of starting over, and you you feel like you feel like you're doing it better, or do you feel like you're just fishing better places? I I mean. The first one. Um, I feel like, yeah. you know, it's not every day you get to like wipe your slate clean and move yeah. to a different state, you know, and kind of start over. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't necessarily have the bad habits or the history or, you know, the memories to fish from up here. So I don't know if I'm looking at things different, but I mean, and I've always had an eye for baits and colors just because that's what I've done, you know, mm -hmm. professionally. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I do. Um, and, uh, but I'm I'm OCD. I'm super like attention to detail. Very organized. Organized, and More I mean me. to me details matter. You know, so whether whether it come down to colors or line size or just repeating what you did, you know, to catch that first mm -hmm. one and and just picking up on all that stuff. But yeah, those are all attributes of good anglers, in my opinion. I noticed that across the board on tour at the, on the elite series level, is that. All these, all these dudes that I'm fishing against, you know, like, okay, the top five in this tournament, you got one guy from Kentucky, one guy from Texas, one guy from Florida, one guy from Missouri. The one common denominator, them dudes, you don't get much past them dudes. Yeah. And they're all like, hey, do you see that fog on the water? Yeah. I mean, that fog is real low like that and, and bite a buzz bait real good. Who, who notices how high the fog is? Yeah. Like, yeah, if the fog gets up too high. It ain't, it ain't, and that it stuff's ain't, still no over my head. But like, they... But you'll hear three dudes say the same thing in the top five. Like th yeah. that's what happens on the elite series. Then that's the but, stuff I want to know. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, but like, it's the learn. attention, it, but it's, you'll learn it. Like you, you observe it. I've yeah. heard you say little things like that too. Like, yeah, you know, you, cause you, you've taken your buddy out, Chris Morrison. Well, he's probably watching, hopefully. He and will. We'll, we'll call him I'll out. Make like him. You, you've, um, you've roasted him a few times on the water. Yeah. Fishing the same bait, same rod, same reel, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because of something very minute and little and teeny that you picked up, you probably didn't even know you were picking it up. Yeah. I I, I put that in the bucket called feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like you just feel, it just feel, you just know what the feel is. Yeah. And it's something you can't explain. Bait. Right. So of whatever like, bait it is. The, the day you're talking um, about. Because Chris is a good fisherman. Oh, and, yeah. And, yeah. He's a really good fisherman. Yeah. Um, and he's seasoned. He's been in a bunch of different places as well. Yeah. And, yeah, he's fished all over. I mean, New York, Canada, up north, out yeah. east, and yeah. now Middle Tennessee. So, um, but, I mean, so you put another you know, two good fishermen together. There's been more than one day where you put the wood to him. Yeah. And he said the other day, he's like, man, I think there's only been one time where you didn't catch by far the biggest fish of the day out of all the times you've ever been fishing. And it's I'm, a it's a feel thing. So like I'm you, like, well, you, you have that you have that low fog thing I was just talking about. Yeah. But it's just every every day is different. You know? Yeah. That's just yeah. the way I look at it. So that, just tell us, um, tell us a kind of fun fun story from the waters just over the years. Uh, maybe uh, maybe a something crazy or fun that happened out there on the water? I mean, there's plenty of fun. Yeah. Um, fortunately, there's never, knock on wood, there hadn't been anything too crazy mm -hmm. um, in in my time. <laughs> well, t tell us about your the day you caught your the biggest stringer. And it was over 35 pounds for your best five. Yeah. It was what, how big was the five? The, the biggest five was 39 pounds, 13 ounces. Thir so, damn near 40 pounds yeah and this is on a, a certified is a catch commander scale yep. or catch commander scale on a catch commander scale so this is like not we all we call this one a 10 when it's actually a seven yeah no None it's, of that it's accurate. went on it i mean that's for that's that's pretty crazy in my opinion i thought so so like i it was on a it was on some small body of water right yep small body of water in year it was what time of year was it it was february 22nd Approximately February 22nd. It was winter. And water temperature was? It was 
I'd say low to mid forties. So cold. Yeah. Cold. What was the bait of choice or baits of choice that day? Um, I imagine you were using big baits, tennis shoes, um, big swim baits. So to set it up last year, I got into the big baits and still the, is by the, the way. well come spring i kind of you know well you know i'm going to go i'm going to do what i know you know mm -hmm. and so i i kind of i sold some of them and you know to buy whatever newest thing i wanted and kind of i wasn't happy with the rods i had for that so i sold those and um it was they weren't cashins i got rid of the non cashins right uh, at this point but um anyway come well this was two years ago so then last winter i'm like man if i'm going to do this i'm going to do it right so i went out and bought you know the tranks 300s or you know mm -hmm. just dedicated yeah. higher end swim bait setups and um and then i've gone a little crazy since but it, it's paid off i've caught more big fish here than i ever have so this particular day i had uh who was fishing with you chris morrison mm -hmm. was there um we were in my skeeter and uh we could catch them early on a blade bait not a blade bait um an underspin, underspin. Okay. catch them early on an underspin and then in the afternoons you know it's all about the bait fish so we had identified this little area um we could see them on the bottom but they wouldn't eat on the bottom so say we were i was throwing a huddleston you know wasn't getting touched and uh i'm like man i think they're feeding up because i mean you can watch them streaking up streaking on your up electronics yeah and Just 2d uh, sonar 2d yeah um side imaging you could mm -hmm. see the bait okay you know on the hummingbird i mean you, you know what they're doing and then the, the 2d you could just watch it mm -hmm. i'm like they have to be feeding up so i put on this new to me osprey seven inch you know line through mm -hmm. and uh caught ended up we caught set i caught seven fish i say i I caught seven fish, um, had a three and a two and then a five. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm firing an osprey out there in, you know, low 40s, mid 40s. And I'm like, man, this shouldn't, you know, this, this shouldn't funny. be the deal. Right. You know, boot tail swim bait moving. I mean, I'm throwing it slow, but I count it down. But I'm watching fish just blow through bait on the 2D. So I'm like, whatever. Um... The second one was a six and change. And uh, Chris is now starting to, like, we've got a joke, like, man, what's your number? You know, well, what do you mean? I'm like, how many do I have to catch doing this before you do the same thing? <laughs> what's your number? Like, is it four? Is it five? Is it you 12, know? yeah. Like 12. And so, like, Chris and I's number is one. So, mm -hmm. so he's already like, give me one of those baits. So he's throwing, same bait, standing right next to each other, making the same cast. Um, second fish, big fish, I hook up on six. I'm like, dude, this is a big one, you know, and I don't ever take my net out. So he reached down there and lips this one. We're taking pictures, high fives, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, 15, 20 minutes later, I set up again and it's eight and change and he's starting to get mad. Like, what the hell is going on here? Like you're standing right next to me making the same cast. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't He's know. He's in the middle of a butt whipping. Yeah. What he was. And he hadn't, he hadn't had a bite all day. Um, so then the bite kind of slowed down on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'm like, well, I'm just going to change it up. You know, I put on a smash tech head hunter and uh, started fishing that. The next one was nine pounds even. But at this point, and they're all in consecutive order. Right. So keep like, getting, just keep when, getting bigger. I, when I'm setting up, I'm like big fish. He's like, yeah, you just said that. And I'm like, no, no, this is bigger. And it comes up and I'm like, oh my God. So like, we, we weigh that and it's like, this is the craziest day ever. And fire back out there. And I'm like, dude, this one's bigger. And he's like, you just caught a nine. You know, how's this bigger? You know, 10 pound, 11 ounce, new PB. 10, 11. Is that the biggest one you've ever caught? That's the biggest. I've caught three over 10. That's the biggest. 10, 11. Wow. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's like, I, you know, and I'm like, man, I don't know. Like you're throwing the same pound line, same mm -hmm. day, counting it down the same. I don't know. So, but I'm like, best day ever. <laughs> yeah. 10, 9, 8, 10, a nine, six, eight five. A 6, and a 5. Wow. Yeah. What a day. 
And yeah. I'm like keeping track of it on my phone, adding it up. And I'm like, dude, that's 39 pounds, 13 ounces. Dang, that's so, amazing. All on big swim baits, which was new to me. And like after that, it's kind of, you know, and there's a time and a place for it to right. me. It's not like I'm selling my conventional tackle and going right. all big baits. Yeah. But, which it's, a lot of guys do, and we're not knocking. And I'm you not knocking. If you, yeah, no, but I'm, I can completely understand it. I get honestly. it. Honestly, I totally get it. Yeah, but I like, you know, I want to catch fish. Like it all, yeah. You know, regardless of where I'm at, and if I'm fishing fishing priest, I, you know, I might leave some of those baits at home. Right. You know, and and my go-to might be a quarter ounce micro football. Mm-hmm. But which you have put to work there. Either way, I, I plan on catching fish. No. So. All right. So with your all the big spe- you know recently caught in your PB mm-hmm. 10 11 what are your what's your next what's your next fishing goal what do you want to do do you want to you want to try some regional tournaments you want to try to catch a 12 uh what like what's your what's your what's on your your hit list for fishing goals so we've got my wife and I Ashley we've got two girls under 3 uh Savannah our oldest turns 3 this coming Saturday um so we've been busy with that, and so I haven't been trying to, you know, spend a bunch of time away from home. So mm-hmm. I figure once the girls get a little older, um, but but for me the plan is to continue to learn these local lakes, whether it be, you know, I would love to jump in the BFLs. So what, yeah, because where you ABAs live, I mean, or, within a three or four hour radius, you've got a, a ton of lakes. Bass, yeah, haven, mm-hmm. you know, like big tournament. Yep. historic lakes all around within a couple hour drive mm-hmm. yeah so i'm trying to make my rounds now and just get a feel for the lakes and learn them and yep. get some kind of history and understanding going there yeah how the fish set up and before i just show up and donate you know right so you, there's a there's a mild um uh, tournament in in your goals oh yeah yeah um, for sure and I mean, I don't care who you are. If you catch anything eight pounds or bigger, mm-hmm. a bass, you want to catch awesome. another one. Yeah, yeah, you want to do it again. Yeah. So, I, I'm. Are you are you actively trying to continue to break your PB? Or oh just, yeah. You just no, want to catch I'll, tens. I'm, I'm down to catch the biggest fish that'll eat. Yeah. You know, like I. Because in in that part of Tennessee, there are twelves and bigger. I've so. I've heard of sixteen pounders. And uh, I've seen, I watched a crappie guy catch an 11 pound, eight ounce. Yeah. No, it was 11.8, which basically a 12 yeah. mm-hmm. um, on a crappie jig and a 10 foot rod and like four pound test. Yeah. Like right in front of me with Chris. Oh my um, gosh. And the guy was mad. I took pictures and he waited on my scale. He was pissed because it wasn't a crappie. But I'm like, dad, you know, so you know they're there. Right. And I'm like, mm, you know, like, I I would I would love to catch a teener. Yeah. You know. I I, I desperately want to catch a teen. I can yeah. tell you that right now. But I mean, I'll settle for an eleven, and then a twelve or right. whatever. I'm not going to be mad. Right. Yeah, they're um, all. Amazing. But then smallmouth too, like Dale Hollow. My big my my biggest smallmouth to date's like five something. Maybe it was mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah. No. So that's definitely doable. That's doable. Yeah. Dale Hollow this winter. It's going to happen. Catch a six. Tim's Ford. Or it bigger. Can happen. Six or bigger. Yeah. I've caught some big ones out of Tim's Ford. Mm-hmm. I'm just having fun. I, I don't know that I've got uh, clear. You're still in the newlywed phase of coming yeah, back into bass Of getting fishing. back into bass fishing. So I'm like, wow, these big baits are really cool and really expensive and I want them all. And then, but yet, oh, these mega bass has a cool new blade bait over here, you know? Right. So, like, I could do that in the winter. Right, and right. This, it depends on what lake I go to, but I want to go to all of them. Yeah. And, you know, it uh, it's still fun. Hell yeah. So, hell but yeah, yeah the, the ultimate goal is to get back into tournament fishing because I do miss that. Mm-hmm. You know, I fished a couple smaller regional things and, and did okay. Um, he did win the Pittman Creek Distributor Show I tournament did, last yeah. year. Yeah. On Douglas. On Douglas. First time ever being there. Yep. Yeah. That was fun. Yep. So. Yep. So that was, uh, you got that under mm-hmm. your belt and on your trophy case. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, all right. I, I really appreciate you coming in. Yeah. And taking the time to, to do this. And hopefully you guys out there learned a few things, uh, not only about Byron, but also about fishing in general and how much bass is his life and my life and 
probably your life if you're still watching if this. If you're still probably, watching this. Probably your it life, too. probably is. So uh, if you want to see, uh, if you have any questions specifically for Byron, hit them down there in the comments. And if I don't know the answer to his question, I will ask him and we'll get your question answered. If you have any comments for him, there's a good chance he will see it. Uh, he may actually reply back to your comments sure. uh, once this video is, uh, is put up on the web. So uh, I appreciate everybody watching and look forward to seeing you next time on the Bass Life Podcast.